briefly, I want to uh, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to, the, in particular, the team leaders who were able to come out, I, and all of you, frankly. I know budget times are tough. Uh, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to who are really struggling, and I know that for those of you who are here, some people paid out of pocket. Um, it, it's been a stretch, but I'm very impressed that so many of you were able to come, all the team members and everybody in the room. I'd like to uh, make a special mention of uh, Michael Gilbertson. Where are you, Michael? Uh, co-founder of Getting to Know Cancer, my partner in this uh, venture, I guess. Uh, our guest speakers uh, this morning, uh, special invited guests outside of the task force, uh, Rick Wojcik uh, at uh, NIEHS, and uh, also Cynthia Ryder and Danielle Carlin, uh, both uh, from NIEHS as well. Uh, Linda Tuschler and Glenn Rice, and pardon me, you'll get uh, more uh, formal introductions as we go later to their talks. Laura Vandenberg, from, uh, who are both from the EPA, by the way. Um, Laura Vandenberg from Tufts, who's going to talk to us about low-dose exposures. And David Carpenter, where are you? Thank you, David. Uh, David, who was uh, very graciously handling the, both the grant submission and the grant uh, applications uh, process. So uh, very welcome. Thank you for that. I want to talk briefly about the project. Uh, it won't take very much of your time, and then we'll move right into the talks. Uh, like many of you, I have had cancer in my own family. I was uh, my grandfather, and this picture on the right was very dear to me. And when he was, when I was 18, he was 60 or something, and he died. I visited him regularly as a high school student at the time with my driver's license, and spent a lot of time with him as he laid at home, sort of dying. It was a very deep and impacting process on me. The little girl in the middle there is my aunt. It was his daughter and my aunt. And we played together. And 10 years ago, she died uh, in her 40s. Um, very dear play friend of mine as kids. And I really struggled to make sense of the fact that you know she was in her 40s. It didn't make any sense. Uh, I understood it, it's just that it, you know, it was something that left me. I had, at the time, I had my own son, who's five, uh, bothered me that it you know, could take anybody at any time. All of us have these kinds of stories to tell. That's me on the bike, by the way. That was when I was the same age as her. She was just a little older than me. When my aunt died uh, 10 years ago, I spent eight years obsessed with learning about cancer. Uh, it didn't start that way. It was a simple process. They say there are people who like to look at the forest first and people who like to look at trees first. I'm a forest guy. I like the big picture. And uh, when I start digging into the cancer literature, there was no forest. It was just trees. <laughs> I was deep in the woods uh, reading one PubMed article after another, lost. Uh, I back to first principles, relearned my biology ground up everything. And it took me eight years, sometimes four and five hours a day. I would do a couple hours before breakfast, sometimes over lunch, middle of the afternoon, up before bed. My wife wondered what I was really doing. <laughs> uh, but uh, about a couple of years ago, it was to me, it was like a light bulb came on. I finally, it was like the pieces came together. And uh, if I don't think if I would have known how complicated it was, I would have ever continued way back at the beginning. But uh, I did it. Anyway. Uh, really, I was just looking to understand the science, and when I came, when I got to the end of the process, I felt like, from an exposure standpoint, we were sort of entrenched in a carcinogen paradigm. All the research that we were doing on in environmental health seemed largely focused on mutagens and mutagenesis, and uh, it bothered me because I'd done so much reading on drugs and therapies, et cetera, and knew that chemicals could manipulate various facets of cancerous biology. It bothered me that we didn't have the same level of sophistication in the kind of work we were doing on the exposure science side of things. Um, essentially, we, I, at one point in time, using various things that I had sort of cobbled together and working with uh, the different people that I was talking to, I tried to parcel out the literature into areas where there was good support, like broad areas of literature that really there was something under. And we settled on these 11 areas. This sort of happened later. but. Essentially, that's how we came to the 11 teams that this task force is comprised of. Uh, the idea was, let's focus on areas where there's strong literature support, and let's look at each of those areas individually. This is just a cartoon of sorts, but uh, you know, what we were getting at, I guess, is that there's five different colors in this diagram. And each one, you can see areas of concentration. I've drawn circles around them. And we tend to focus on, in toxicology, the kinds of research was on toxic effects, toxic effects in organs, toxic effects in certain tissues, 
And often we would focus exclusively on the areas where toxicity showed. But the question that I was asking, really something that started this whole process was, well, what about areas where there's not toxic effects, but we still see residual amounts of chemicals in different tissues? Because when you do radio tracer labeling studies and you look at where tissue fate of different kinds of chemicals that go into a, an animal, you know, there's obvious uh, tissue affinity in different glands and different organs, but there's, sometimes it's distributed widely. Uh, and so we focus on areas of toxicity and we build safety levels from there, but the question that I was asking was, well, what if we have disruptive effects in these different areas, all happen to be coincident in the trillion cells that are in somebody's body in one location, just by chance? Um, Statistically, of course, as you lower the levels of exposure, that becomes a, a less possible event. But, you know, all the cancer theories that we've looked at are working under the assumption that if you get one immortalized cell making copies of itself, you're in business. And so from a cancer standpoint, the question I was asking was, what happens in a small piece of tissue somewhere in the body where you've got coincident exposures of multiple chemicals disrupting different areas down this list, uh, or all areas down this list, hypothetically speaking? I got help initially from uh, Theo Colborn, who some of you know, low-dose uh, endocrine disruption work she's done. You know, she's really a pioneer in that area. And she pointed me to Michael Gilbertson, who's worked with her for a long time. He did work with the International Joint Commission between Canada and the United States on pollution in the Great Lakes. He's looked at transgenerational effects and different low-dose exposures to the general population. And Michael's been a tremendous source of wisdom and advice to me through this whole process. But he helped me turn this into something. We, we set out to talk to scientists initially. Some of you are here. I put red squares around David Carpenter, Thomas Anderson, um, Philippa Darbra and Elizabeth Ryan, but there was a larger board of people that when we started talking to them about mixtures and we were saying, you know, what about combinations of effects and why aren't we using the cancer biology that we have today to inform our risk assessment practices and combining current toxicological methods with cancer biology so that we improve and refine our risk as assessment practices, they were saying, yes, exactly, that's what we need. Now, my problem is I'm, I was nobody. My background, I was telling somebody on the bus. I was in the Air Force originally, aerospace engineering officer, worked in underwater acoustics before the Cold War, went to industry, was a senior manager in a company that made oceanographic equipment uh, for oceanographic instrumentation. Um, I worked in electronics and engineering, worked for aerospace software, electronics. Now I teach international business. My faculty job at this college is in international business. I teach international marketing, trade finance, things that have nothing to do with this. But I spent the last 10 years living and breathing cancer every day. And I at least am to the point where I felt like I had something to offer. And the scientists on this advisory board said, yeah, we can do something. Let's get something together. And so I said, well, I'll help push the organization of the effort forward, but I'm not the scientist. So lots of you have sent me emails, kind emails, Dr. Lowe, da da da. I'm not a PhD and I'm not an MD. This is just an area that I've found myself in and felt that I had something to contribute and I really just tried to help organize what we're doing. So bear with me if I, you find me in spots where I'm weak on the science side of things. I tend to know a lot about a little about a lot of the areas that we're working in, but if you push me into the depths of where you're individually are working, usually I'll get lost. Um, just briefly, uh, I wanted to talk, I, I already mentioned the toxicology and risk assessment points. The thing that I wanted to emphasize here was that I found, and I've talked to people in the different regulatory agencies, regulatory agencies are open to change. They're looking for answers. And the people, even in the practical side, that are responsible for delivering risk assessment practices, you know, they don't like the fact that it's complicated, but they know that they've got to move forward. So I've been encouraged by that. In fact, I'm, you know, I'm encouraged by everybody that I'm running into. They all want to do something. And really, this attempt was to bring people together to get the best of cancer biology to match it with what we know about toxicology and help it use to do something meaningful from a risk assessment standpoint. Main goals for this project then are to integrate cutting edge biology and toxicology and use it to form risk assessment practices and to produce a coherent argument in the peer reviewed literature that really does this justice. That was the point of the special issue. We had really good responses from the journals and carcinogenesis thought this was a great idea. It had good support with them. I was talking to them yesterday. I think we're going to find, you know, they're very open to what we're doing. I think it's, uh, it's important. 
one of the other things that I want you to think about, and this is really important, is that one of the things we knew with all the complexity of what we understand of cancer is that there's a tendency generally in the scientific community to sketch out big projects because cancer is complicated. Cancer genome, proteome, exome, uh, exposome, sorry. There's lots of ways that we could create this as a more complicated long-term endeavor. But what we were really talking about when we started this out was how do we decide whether or not what this hypothesis that we've raised is even an issue? And if it is, how do we make it compelling so that the public will pay attention? Because there's lots of stuff out there, but until the public has the attention, we, you know, funding doesn't follow, I guess, is the, is the main issue. I want you to think about this project in the most simplistic of terms as I want this task force to design a powerful carcinogenic mixture. Lots of the papers that I've seen in draft form default at, in various places to what we can do on the therapeutics. And most of us, uh, most of you, sorry, pardon me, are schooled to, if you're studying cancer biology, to explain the relevance from a therapeutic standpoint. What do we do with it? But I want this task force to understand that in this project, I want you to think about how do we make cancer? with what's lying around, and how do we avoid all the usual suspects and look at the things that are disruptive, selectively disruptive, in each of your areas. And each of you bringing together a contribution lay down something that we can use for empirical results. Because unless we can actually demonstrate that this is an issue, it's a hypothesis. I understand that. Uh, but it's compelling from what we know about the biology. And so your team's challenge is to use what we know is out there, ubiquitous in the environment, generally believed to be safe or certainly not carcinogenic. And what kind of mixtures might we look at that we should be concerned about to create the kind of compelling evidence that is broadly applicable to the general population, can't be avoided, that might be contributing to cancer incidence as we know it today. Um, it, in my opinion, until we actually can do that, produce something for the public that says that we may have a real problem here, you know, there just won't be funding for the kind of research that is needed to make this so. Now, we might not be able to produce empirical results in the near term, certainly not within the context of this project. But the goal is to lay out the framework to show what would be useful as demonstration, for a demonstration's sake even in the crudest of terms, to prove that this works. Think back to the work that was done on tobacco in the 30s. In Chile, there was a researcher who looked specifically at putting tobacco tar on rabbits' ears and found out that if you could damage the ears with a, with a cut and then add tar, you could get cancer to start. But you couldn't do it without the cut. It, it was sort of the two-step hypothesis, you know, damage and promotion. We're going to talk about creating a very complicated model, one that respects the different the cancer biology in all the areas that your teams are working on, one where we know there are instigating factors that matter. And what kind of mixtures would we come up with that are ubiquitous and common in the environment now that might constitute that kind of combination that would give us the kind of effects that we might expect to see at doses far below what anybody might have anticipated otherwise? Uh, couple of things about taking part in this project. I think that for all of you, if we're successful in this regard, we're going to be part of something that's breaking entirely new ground in cancer science. There's good opportunity for collaboration here because there's such a diverse group of perspectives. I, you know, one of the things I struggled with when I was trying to put this project together was that everybody is deeply siloed in cancer because in, in fact, in science, you're paid to be specialized and get to the cutting edge. But to be specialized, you've got to go deep. And to go deep, you often don't go broad. So hopefully, there will be some new collaborations formed in this task force that will pay off for each of you individually in the long run. And the money will come. Uh, but look, the cancer incidence is unacceptably high. Everybody knows that. And, in, and when we used to think that lifestyle factors accounted for 98% since Dahl and Pito's work in 81. But if you look at the research that's come along, the epidemiological work since, it seems that we're less certain and less certain about exactly what we know constitutes how much. This could be a very important piece of the puzzle that we're trying to solve. The format for the workshop, if I could just lay it out for you, is that uh, this morning we're going to hear from uh, Rick Wojcik, Dr. Wojcik uh, from NIHS, who's going to talk about uh, the importance of what we're doing from their perspective and what their goals are. 
We're going to talk for, here from the individual teams, and it's, I think it's important because most of you have been working in your teams, and that's a very sort of narrow perspective, and I wanted you both to hear from me and to hear from the other teams so you can get some sense of the degree of overlap there is and how each of your work might inform the other work, uh, bits of work that are going on. This evening, or as the day passes, later in the today and tonight at dinner, we're going to hear about from the folks at uh, NIHS and at EPA about toxicology and risk assessment practices for some of you who aren't in environmental health, and I know there's a lot of you that aren't. Um, we're going to hear from uh, Laura Vandenberg about low dose effects, and she was uh, lead author on a very large review that looked at that. EPA has recently done a response, and I think they've written a response to that. So there's some, you know, we're going to get some very fresh insights on where that's at. And at the end of the workshop, we're going to, uh, tomorrow, sorry, we're going to do some breakout sessions. Uh, to get everybody sort of engaged in the process and see, tackle some of the harder issues that we have. And at the end of the day, we'll talk about the capstone paper. We'd like to produce a capstone paper with contributions from all the teams, plus some contributions that come out of this workshop shop, that essentially make the argument in a single article. Something that all people in this room will be authors to, uh, and all of your team members as well. And we hope to be able to generate some publicity when we're done to say that we've done something that we think is important to hopefully inspire just a little bit of funding beyond this project to allow us to get the kind of results that we think are going to be necessary to bring real money to this problem from a research standpoint. Uh, it's a big agenda but, uh, and a lot to do in two days, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to do it justice. <laughs>